Good afternoon and welcome to another Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation's Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Session. We have a special treat for you today. I'm your, your guest host, Michael Kernodal, and today's education uh, educator is Austin Vickery, and the topic is, guess what? How to navigate chord changes. It's going to be a great one. And just a reminder, you know, if you have any questions at all, you can always go into the chat feature and we'll leave some time uh, at the end to answer any questions. And don't forget, if you enjoyed today's session, there's more coming your way. You can go to our website, www.clearwaterjazz.com slash education. And don't forget your feedback is so very, very important to these topics. Um, so if you have something you want us to discuss, just email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com. So Austin is not a visitor to Clearwater Jazz. Uh, just some of the past sessions that he's had an approach to playing lead alto saxophone, baritone sax basics, um, and, and the list goes on. What I love about the series, uh, Charlie Parker, Paul Desmond, Phil Woods, Stan Getz, and Chris Potter. I mean, I know there were some awesome sessions. You can always go back into the archive and check that out. But before we move on, we want to thank our sponsors. You know, please be sure to check out the studio archives of the past video sessions at clearwaterjazz.com, education and outreach section. And that's brought to you by our friends over there, at Blue Water Wealth Management at Stewart Park. Partners and Duke Energy, as well as our Young Lines podcast available wherever you stream. And that's brought to you by our friends at Marine Max Clearwater. Just search Young Lines Jazz Master Virtual Sessions wherever you stream. I just want to tell you a little bit about Austin Vickery. He has an impressive resume. Austin is a saxophonist, a woodwind specialist, composer, arranger, and music educator who currently resides in St. Petersburg, Florida. He's born and raised in Utah. Austin developed love of music at the young age and was awarded the Louis Armstrong Jazz Award upon graduating high school. Amazing. He holds a bachelor's of music in saxophone performance from the University of Utah and a master's in music and jazz studies from the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. From 2004 to 2008, Austin was a, a assistant music director of Earlman College in Richmond, Indiana, where he directed the Earlman College Jazz Band, assisted in the Earlman Orchestra, and taught private lessons on saxophone in jazz theory. And from 2010 to 2016, Austin was the adjunct professor of music for the music industry and recording arts program over there at St. Petersburg College, where he taught classes in music theory, improvisation, performance techniques, and music appreciation. Now, currently, Austin is the adjunct woodwind instructor for John Hopkins Middle School in St. Petersburg, Florida. In addition to teaching, Austin keeps a busy performance schedule and plays throughout the St. Pete, Tampa Bay area with his own groups and as a side man. So if you want more information about Austin, you can check out his website, www.austinvickery.com. So without any more delay, Austin Vickery, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate it. It's really great to be here this afternoon. I want to first just apologize if I am coughing or if my voice sounds a little funny. I've been dealing with kind of a little throat bug thing for the last couple of days. Don't worry. It's not COVID. I'm vaccinated officially as of today, two weeks after that second shot. So we're all good. And I checked just in case because I was getting a little worried. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so if you, if you uh, would oblige me, I've got my ginger tea cough drop going on. So I apologize if, if, if it does sound a little funny, but we'll just push right through. So thanks so much for having me today. And I'm really looking forward to this masterclass. Today, we're going to talk about how to navigate chord changes. And, um, you know, this has been a, it still is a journey for me um, to find new ways to try to report, approach improvising over chord changes. Um, the, real, the real deal here is, um, you know, there's no, there's no real wrong or right way to go about it, but there are, there are some, uh, things that I have found from me, um, that are important to me and in my teaching that I think are super important to understand when we talk about 
navigating or improvising over chord changes, no matter what the style. It doesn't have to be jazz, even though we do tend to focus on the jazz stuff here, but it can be over rock, you know, a, a rock solo or, or a Latin solo or even just like a little eight bar snippet like playing Mustang Sally. You know, there's lots of things that you can do um, within that. And um, you'll hear some of the things. And I've got a PowerPoint uh, presentation, which is, I'm on a Mac, so it'll be Keynote. But a PDF is going to be provided um, on the Clearwater Jazz uh, Holidays education page after the session. Uh, you'll be able to go and access this PDF that you're going to see. And uh, I'll do some demonstrations on my alto sax here. So uh, let's get going. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, let me get my, let's do the share screen thing. There we go. And we'll pull up my keynote. All right. And I got to adjust my view. So, whoops, let me go back. My mouse disappeared. Nope, go back. Sorry about that. I'm adjusting the view so I'm not looking at the uh, video of myself because I tend to do that. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, here we go. How to Navigate Chord Changes by me, Masterclass for Clearwater Jazz Holiday Master Sessions for 2221. So, Here's the overview about what we're gonna talk about today. Um, what are chord changes? Um, some people don't really understand what chord changes are. So I'm gonna go ahead and set up a definition there. Um, chord basics, construction and types and qualities. I could spend a whole masterclass on this, but I'm gonna to try to go through it as quickly as I can. And I will give you some, uh, some reference websites and materials uh, to check out as well. Um, so if, if, if I am kind of talking over your head or if it starts to get a little theory, heavy, you've got somewhere to go where you can kind of brush up on your, on your theory terminology, because I, I feel like a, a good theory foundation is, uh, is important, not always necessary, but important to me. Um, uh, chords and scales and how they work together, learning your chords. I'm going to talk about how that, how that happens. Um, approaches to improvising over chords, um, talking about arpeggios, which means a broken chord for, um, non-chordal instruments like saxophone, trumpet, uh, clarinet, trombone, scales, chord tones, guide tones, connecting notes, resolutions, and then um, thinking outside the box, techniques and exercises to enhance and spice up your improvisation over chords. All right, let's get to it. So what are chord changes? Um, the series of musical chords that make up the harmony to support the melody of a song or part of a song, i.e. solo section. The word changes refers to the chord progression, which is the original term. We talk about a chord progression. If you've taken any kind of music classes. These are the, the chords that support uh, the melody. It's the harmony. They accompany the melody and give context to uh, the melody. In the jazz world, we call them changes because they typically change chord quality from one chord to the next as the song is played. So it's just been kind of a colloquial term. Um, you know, if I'm on the bandstand and uh, somebody calls a tune and uh, maybe I or somebody else doesn't, it, they'll say, hey, you got the changes for that? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about chord changes. That's how we refer to them. And we'll discuss what I mean by quality uh, of a chord. Um, that's a, that's a very specific thing. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, most chord progressions and songs tend to repeat the series over and over for improvisers to play solos and melodies. Um, if we're talking about in a jazz context, you know, we'll play the chorus of a tune of a melody and then repeat that chorus over and over and over with the chords so that an improviser or a person who's taken the melody can improvise over top of them. We say over top, but it's not really over top it's at the same time. Um, I like to think of music in layers and we tend to kind of teach that, but it's not really over top. It's all blended together. So if I use that terminology, that's what I mean. Um, chord changes in jazz can be any length. Most tunes we solo over have a form with a certain number of measures. Could be eight measures solos, 
can be 12, 16, 24, 32. These are common forms and um, uh, uh, lengths of times for solos to happen. If you're in a big band, you might not get a long solo. You might get just eight. You might get 16. Um, sometimes you might even get more than, you might get 32 chorus, uh, 32 measures four times if you got a big long feature solo or if it's a really fast tempo. So chord changes can last almost any length, uh, but those are the typical ones that, that we're gonna talk about. Um, what makes up a chord? Uh, this is a very good question and I really love theory. So I have, most of my teaching is based in a lot of theory, um, but you don't have to be a theory genius. And I'm gonna mention that um, a chord in music is defined as three or more musical pitches or notes sounding at the same time. I got my computer here, or computer. <laughs> we got the computer in front. Um, we have, I've got my uh, electronic piano here. You might not be able to see it in the screen. And I'm not sure if you will be able to hear it very well or not, but I can't get it much louder. I can't get it much louder than that without the speakers blowing out. Um, so I don't know if that's going to do any good. If it, if it sounds okay, let me know. Um, I've got my saxophone here, and we know that that sounds right. Um, the sonority of a chord depends on how these pitches are specifically arranged, or we can say stacked, because we tend to build chords from bottom to top, and that's how we define them. That's the context. Chord doesn't have to be always from bottom to top. We can talk about how they are voiced in different ways, um, especially when it comes to a, a non-chordal instrument. We have to take these chords and take them out of their just what we call root position or just bottom to top uh, structure uh, so that we can deconstruct a little bit and get around on the instrument um, and uh, play some interesting things. So a uh, couple of, of terms, consonant chords, chords that sound pleasing to the ear. Okay, that's what I mean by sonority, how it sounds. Consonants refers to something that sounds good or pleasing to the ear. Obviously, we could say this is subjective, but we're gonna go ahead and say it's, it's common that most, some of these chords that we call consonant um, do sound pleasing to the ear. If you're not familiar with some of the chords, they might not sound so pleasing. Um, quick, real digression. Well, the first time I heard a major seven chord and I knew what it was, I said, that doesn't sound right to me. That sounds weird. I don't like it. I didn't understand what I was listening to. And after I, after I really dug into it and took theory classes and, and experimented with them a little bit more, now the major seven chord is one of the prettiest chords to me. I just love the sound of it. And I don't know if you can hear it on the piano, but I love that sound. Um, we also have dissonant chords, chords that do not sound pleasing to the ear or they sound a little off. Um, I can take a group of notes right next to each other and play them and it's probably not gonna sound great. It's a still a chord, it could be three or more notes, any musical notes. I'm just banging my fingers on the keys here, like three half steps together and a whole step. And it doesn't sound great. There's no context for that chord. It's dissonant. It's still a chord, but we don't have a context for that. We don't have a definition for it. We could analyze it and pick it apart and see if it fits the definitions that we're used to in our typical music theory. Nonetheless, it's a chord it's dissonant, I'm gonna leave it at that. All right, basic common chord types. So in order to understand chord changes, we need to know what the common chord types are. And these are just, just the, the, the run of the mill uh, basic types of chords. We have a triad. A triad is a three note chord arranged in thirds. Now I'm gonna be talking about intervals of thirds. And if you're unfamiliar with intervals, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, a website you can go to to understand what those are. But thirds is basically skips in letters. 
And you can see on my PowerPoint, um, an example of a triad, lowest note, which we call the root, that's the lowest sounding note, the middle note, which we call the third, and the highest note, which we call the fifth. So some examples there in parentheses, C, E, G, okay, C, E, G. That's an example of, of a chord. And I just arpeggiated that chord. Arpeggiation means broken chord. So I just played one note at a time from lowest to highest pitch. I may also refer to that as bottom to top. DFA is a different type of chord, still a triad. Okay. There is a sixth chord, a triad with a sixth interval above the root. So it's just a triad, but we stack one more note on top of it, typically the next letter name in the series. If you're familiar with scales, you'll understand what that means. So root, third, fifth, sixth is a sixth chord. So here we've got one, and I, I, I think I was doing concert pitch before. I'm just gonna do saxophone pitch, so it might sound a little weird, but C, E, G, A is an example of a sixth chord. <laughs> We call that one a C major sixth. Um, I have another uh, chord. This one is called a minor six chord, D, F, A, B. Now, I won't get into too much about why we call this a major and why we call this other one a minor. Um, it's gonna take a lot of time uh, to really explain through all of this. So I haven't meant for this to be a very music theory heavy lesson, but just trying to kind of skim over the basics of understanding what chords are and how they're built. Uh, seventh chord, four note chord arranged in thirds, root, third, fifth, and seventh. C, E, G, B, D, F, A, C. <laughs> So you can kind of see a correlation here. We're stacking notes on top of each other in a very specific sequence. We've got root, third, fifth, seventh. If I stacked another one on top, we'd call it a ninth. If we stacked another one on top of that, we'd call it an 11th and so on and so forth. There are some specific rules um, regarding that, um, but I'm not gonna get too much into that. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can answer those later. Um, and there's also chords with what we call extensions. Extensions are the ninth, the seventh, and the 13th above the root of the chord. Um, also arranged in thirds, though sometimes these, in, these can appear in different combinations, either altered, meaning sharp or flat, lowered or higher, or omitted, discussed in the chord quality section, which we will talk about. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna take a sip of my tea. Oh, ginger tea, love ginger tea. So examples, we've got the ninth, a ninth chord, C, E, G, B, D. So we just stacked another note on top of that. Uh, that's two notes away from the note below it. That's a skip, all right, that's a third. A um, Couple different names for the same thing. 11th chord, C, E, G, B, D, F, and a 13th chord, C, E, G, B, D, F, A. Now, after the A, we would start over with C again in the series, so 13th is as high as we're gonna go for, for chord extensions. So these are your basic common chord types. There are some other chord types that we have. We can do what's called a cluster chord. Chords of three or more notes arranged closely together in intervals of less than a third. It can be a combination of thirds or what we call seconds, steps or half steps. Some of these can be interpreted as other chord types with the extensions, i.e. 9, 11, 13, or six, just closely voiced together. So an example of this is I can do, I think with one hand, um, a cluster chord like this. 
I'm going to play that in a higher octave so that it's a little bit more audible. Now I can reinterpret that as a six nine chord. Okay. Cause I've got the root, the second, the third, the fifth and the sixth all together. But that second is tucked in between the root and the third. And so in jazz, we wouldn't even call it a second in this case, we just call it a ninth, but it's voiced in between. Voicing refers to where the notes are or how the notes are arranged together. So this is just a cluster type of chord arranged as a, a rearranged six nine chord with the ninth just tucked in the middle. So you find out with chords that they don't always have to occur stacked in that specific way. Um, what makes it great is we can, as long as the note is in the chord, we can play it anywhere we want, especially on our, on our instrument. If we're improvising, um, we can play it anywhere. It doesn't have to be always above the root. We just use that as a context for definition of what to call it. That's all it is. It's just a label. Okay. You may discover this without even knowing uh, music theory, but I love, I, I have all these questions and I've always loved music theory. So I love to analyze things so I can better understand them, but that's just me. Some people may not be able to comprehend that sometimes, or it might take them a little bit. Um, but again, I've studied this for a lot, a long time. Um, and so I just really, really like it, but that's just kind of my personality. I love to, uh, define things and, uh, ask questions and, and really dig inside deep of what's going on with, with these types of terms and, and music theory. We also have a suspended chord is another type of chord, um, Major and minor triads and a suspended chord is a chord, either typically major or minor triads and sometimes seventh chords that omits the third and replaces it with a fourth or a second, i.e. a ninth. We can also say a ninth. So a type of chord called C sus four is gonna be three notes. It's gonna be replacing the third with the fourth. And we get this, what's called a suspended type of sound. So if I just play C, F, and G on the piano. We get this kind of tension. It's a different type of tension from this chord. And we call this type of tension a suspension or a suspended chord. If I play it on my instrument, one note at a time, That's kind of what it sounds like. And I can, I can use this chord as a very open type of chord. You can play a lot of things over top of this chord. Um, another type of suspended chord is a, a sus2 chord, C sus2. Again, replacing the third with the second instead of the fourth. So it's gonna sound like this. And if I play it on my saxophone, we call it a sus2. We also have another type. These are just examples. There's lots of different types of chords out there. Um, C9 sus4. Um, so here we're taking the third and completely omitting it. And I'm stacking it as C, G. We're skipping the third entirely. B flat, because we imply a seventh. If you know chord, not, chord theory knowledge, You'll know that if it's a nine, the seventh is implied in there. So C, G, B flat, D, that's the ninth, and then F, that's the sus four. So you've got root, fifth, seventh, ninth, fourth. Now we could also call this an eleventh, but in our nomenclature, we typically refer to it as a sus four. And I've starred that eleventh. It says we can all can also be voiced can be voiced either way, the fourth or the eleventh. I could put that F um, right before the G. 
and still have the same type of sound. It's just going to sound a little bit more dense. So it doesn't change the quality of the chord at all. It just changes the sonority of it a little bit. So if I voice it here, I don't know if I can do this on one hand. <clears throat> I'm just going to play it on my saxophone and save some time. So I'm going to do it this. Okay, so you can hear that F right at the top there. Now I can change that up and put the F underneath the G and it sounds like this. So now I'm just kind of, I kind of trailed off there and uh, lost my focus, but you can kind of see like, if you start experimenting with these types of chords and sounds, and we're gonna talk about how to do this a little later, your, your ear and your instinct will start to pick up on that. And it can take you to really, really wonderful places. And you can find out a lot about these chords and about what sounds good to you, what's, what you're really hearing internally. And uh, that just comes right out in your instrument too. So the more time you spend with these chords, getting to know them and understanding what they sound like and the notes that are involved, it's really going to help you be able to navigate through these chord changes with less effort and make it more effortless. Okay. And that's what we want. We want to flow when we improvise, we want it to just roll off, uh, roll off our back, I guess. I don't know what else, how else to say it. Um, all right. Pardon me. I'm just going to take a sip here. And I realize I might be talking a little fast too. So if anybody has questions, you know, just, just stop me, um, interrupt me, let me know um, if there's a question about what I've said or what I'm saying and what we're talking about. All right, let's keep going. A couple other different chords that we want to be aware of uh, in our, in our uh, journey here is slash chords. Okay, Co a slash chord is a chord where the bass note is indicated with a forward slash. These can be inversions of chords that use chord tones. The bass note uh, can be a non-chord tone or extension for more dissonance. Used a lot in modern sounding jazz tunes. So um, you take some stuff by say Herbie Hancock. Okay, if anybody's familiar with some Herbie Hancock, um, Herbie Hancock used a lot of slash chords or uses a lot of slash chords in some of his jazz standards. And even now, a lot of uh, modern and contemporary um, composers and arrangers will you make use of the slash chords because they, uh, they're not just a generic sound. They offer a little bit more depth to, to the chord. So here's an example of a, of a slash chord here, C major seven slash E. So all that means is if I see that chord, that means that the root of that chord, or actually the bass note, not the root, there's a clear difference. Sorry, I misspoke there the bass note, which means the lowest note of the chord, is E. So it's being very specific about how to voice this. So you can voice the C major seven however you want, but we want to have the E in the bass. There's a very specific sound for that. So we've got the E, then the C, the E is the third, C is the root, G is the fifth, and B is the seventh. So if I do that here, then let's see what I've got. I've got... I don't know if I can do this here. Might be a little spread out. E, C, G, B, E, C, G, B. So there's that, there's that low, that third in the bass. And it, it, it basically is like a first inversion major seven chord. That's all it is. It's just rearranged a little differently. And if you want to know what first inversion is, again, um, I'm going to refer you to a website here pretty soon that will we'll talk about all uh, some of the music terminology I'm using if you're not familiar with it. Um, on the saxophone, it's going to sound like this. <laughs> So now on the saxophone or non-chordal instrument, I don't have to play the chord in that structure at all. 
all I got to do is say, oh, I know what the notes are. I can create whatever I want out of that. It just gives me a little bit more specificity and context to the chord. Here's another very strange one. Um, we've got C over F sharp. Now, C is going to refer to, in this case, the triad, the major triad C. If it's not uh, indicated, it's assumed to be major. But when you see the slash, you know that it's a single note, that bass note at the bottom. So that's an F sharp. So the way we would perceive this is to have the F sharp on the bottom, then the C, then the E, then the G. So we would refer to this as a sharp four because F is the four, but F sharp would be a sharp four. Sharp four, root, third, fifth. And that's gonna sound like this. That's a really cool sound. I really like that. So just a little sidestep here. If I wanna explore this more, Maybe I would not play this voicing specifically, but push all of the possible notes together and kind of mess with this sound and just play these sounds a little bit. This is something I'm gonna talk about a little later, but I'll give you a little preview. So if I were to explore this type of chord on my instrument, I would just realize what the notes are that are involved and then rearrange them however I hear in my ear or however I'm thinking about it. I like to call it a shape. It's not really a shape, but it's it's how I how I arrange it. I'm thinking about up and down and and uh, uh, putting the notes in different uh, registers to create something different. You know, leaps or steps. Um, so if I were to experiment with this, it would sound similar to something like this. <laughs> I cheated. I put a ninth in there, but that's where my ear took me. And that's okay. That's okay. Um, sometimes that's going to happen. Um, you know, I could put other notes in there and, and be creative about it. The real point is, is to get to know the sound internally so that when you see it, you can actually hear it in your head before. And you kind of have an idea of what it sounds like and what is going to sound appropriate or fit the chord. I'm not always going to say that sounds good or sounds bad, because those are subjective terms. And in, in, in jazz or improvis highly improvisatory music, we want to be able to experiment with what sounds either fit the chord or don't fit the chord. Um, there's going to be some context there uh, that, uh, you know, sometimes we can lose the context of that. And context is really the important thing style, inflection, um, you know, style being the biggest one. Um, I don't go to a gig uh, that's a blues gig or a rock gig or a wedding band gig and play Charlie Parker and Coltrane um, lines. I don't do that because that doesn't fit the style. I want to be able to play the style of the music. So understanding these chords and understanding the style of music that you're, that you're playing uh, will give you the context for what you are going to play and what you want to play. All right, one more thing. Um, polychords. Two chords, typically triads, sounding at the same time. So completely different chords. This is where we get into like two chords at the same time. So kind of sounds very strange. Polytonal. Okay, if you've ever heard of that word polytonal, two keys or two types of chords going on at the same time, it can kind of sound really, really dense. And I like to say crunchy. I love that word to describe it, where it's just like, it makes you kind of go, ooh, 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 this is weird. This is weird. I don't know if I like it, but it's kind of cool at the same time. You know, I like that word, crunchy. That's kind of like, ugh, okay. Um, these are usually written as a fraction using a horizontal line as opposed to a forward slash line used in more advanced or modern sounding tunes. Now I indicated it with a vertical line just to make it clear because I was having a hard time trying to put in, you know, a letter and then the uh, dash and then, or the, the horizontal line. So if you'll see in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the presentation, I've got a straight up vertical line 
um, to mean uh, the polychord. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, what this is is a C horizontal line D is a D major triad on the bottom and a C major triad on the top. So it would be voiced D, F sharp, A from the bottom up and then C, E, G. So on the piano, it's gonna sound like this. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's a very dense chord, very dense chord. If I arpeggiate it, it will sound like this. Now, we can also redefine this as a, another type of chord. I could look at this and call this um, something else, like some kind of a dominant chord based on what I see. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but that's, that's something different. Even though it sounds like that, that's not really the goal of this, um, this uh, nomenclature here. It's to say, okay, we want to hear two different chords together at the same time. Um, plus there's a, a note that G on the top conflicts with, uh, if I said this was a, a D7, well, actually it could be a D, D uh, suspended dominant, uh, uh, suspended dominant chord. Um, I'm not gonna get into too, into too much of why it's a dominant right now, but um, if you're a music theory person, you can kind of see why that would be so even though we still have a third in there, uh, suspended usually omits it, but you can still play it, you just don't hang on it. Um, anyway, all right, let's not get too tied up into that. Here we go, let's keep going. All right, so I do wanna briefly cover chord qualities, and this is what we were talking about, about qualities. The quality of a chord refers to the specific intervals between the notes of a given chord, okay? So if I've got like C, E, G, then I'm talking about the quality depends on the distance, the measured distance between the C and the E, and then the E and the G, or the C and the E and the C and the G. Okay, we can define it two different ways. And when I'm talking about distance, I'm talking about half steps, okay? Half steps are what define these qualities, the number of the half steps in between the two notes. Now I've got a star here that says, if you're not familiar with intervals, qualities, or some of these terms, I've been talking about so far, you should check out musictheory.net for a crash course in intervals, chord qualities, and a lot of terms. It's such a wonderful website. I, I use it all the time in my teaching. Um, I use it in uh, middle school a lot uh, when I want to you know, refer a student to a, a particular lesson or, or in, my, uh, in my private lessons if I'm teaching somebody about music theory or teaching them about um, you know, what chord qualities are and how to, how, how to get around them and, and play them and understand what they are. This is such a great tool and it's free. It's so free. <laughs> so check it out. It's such a great resource. The types of triad qualities are major, minor, augmented, and diminished. Seventh chord qualities, the basic ones are major seven, minor seven, dominant seven, half diminished seven and diminished seven. Now I can also call that fully diminished seven to be really specific. And then there are some advanced qualities of chords where we start to combine some of the qualities together. Um, one of my favorite chords is called a minor major seven chord. I'm just gonna play it real quick because I just love this chord. It's so much fun to mess around with. It's so eerie, creepy, dense, crunchy in a way. I love this chord. So here's a minor major seven chord. Here's what it sounds like. Now I added some other notes in there, a couple of different ones but that's kind of the overall sound of the minor major seven chord. I really, really like that. If you're familiar with any um, klezmer music or uh, Jewish holiday music or celebration music, 
really, really, this sound is there everywhere. I'm sure you'll be able to hear it. I mean, if I play. Okay. Um, 10 bonus points if you know what that is. <laughs> anybody, anybody? It's Hava Nagila. It's a Jewish celebration wedding song. I play a lot. Okay. Uses that specific type of sound. It's really great. Um, there's one called an augmented major seven chord, dominant seven augmented, altered dominant. Altered refers to the extensions. Nine, 11, and 13 can be altered, meaning sharp or flat. All right. So lots of different chord qualities. If you're not familiar with all of these, um, I urge you to check out musictheory.net or um, there's another site that I list later that is a really great site that I've discovered called uh, learnjazzstandards.com. It's such a great website. It talks a little bit about some, some theory stuff in there too. Um, and if you have any questions about this stuff, you know, I can explain it in further detail, but right now, it's, it's going to take us a little bit more time to get into that. So, and I'm already talking way too much. <laughs> so let's keep going. All right. Here's some of the meat of this. We've got chords and scales and how they work together. So chords typically come from extracting the notes from the scales. Okay. They are not the same thing. It's really important. And this is something I wish somebody would have told me when I was learning this on my own. They're not the same thing because I would look at a C major seven and go, oh, I, I should play a, uh, a C major scale over that, okay? Not always, all right? If, if all I do is think of a scale, then that's all I'm gonna play. And your improvisations shouldn't always be scalar because it, it gets boring after a while. You wanna create interest. You know, there's so many other more fun and interesting things to play. So again, chords imply scales. Okay, they are not scales. They are not the same thing. Chords are separated notes from scales. Okay, I could still play um, a different type of scale over C major seven chord um, and it would still sound fine. Okay, but C major seven implies the use of the C major scale, but it does not necessarily mean that you should do that all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's useful to be able to think of the scale that is implied by a chord but be careful not to fall into the trap of equating the two, okay? Just because I see a C major seven does not mean that I can only play the tones of the C major scale. I call this Abersold syndrome. And if anybody is familiar with the Jamie Abersold play along tracks, I grew up on these things, okay? That's, uh, that's how I started learning how to play over chords and, and improvise, uh, even with no jazz instruction at all. I could just read the book, but I did fall into that trap where I was trying to fit all these notes of a scale implied by the chord all the time. And it, it just became so complicated and struggling. And it wasn't until I got a little bit more education and some great private instructors that, that showed me like, Hey, you don't always have to play the scale just because you see that, that, that chord doesn't mean you should be playing a scale. There's lots of other things you can play. So I call this Abersold syndrome. Be careful not to be fall into the trap of playing scales all the time over chords. All right, let's keep going. Learning your chords. So it's really important if you wanna navigate uh, chord changes, if you really wanna understand them, it is essential that you learn to play and memorize as many chords as possible, starting with the basic types of chords. So for a beginner, start memorizing your triads, and all the qualities of the triad. There's, there's four qualities of triads. Be able to play them all. All the seventh chords, or beginners, seventh chords, and the five basic qualities of seventh chords that we talked about earlier on. Um, if you're an intermediate player, um, start working on your chords with extensions, like ninths, elevenths, thirteenths. We talk about a sixth chord. is not necessarily an extension because it's underneath the seventh and not above it. Anything above the seventh, we're going to call a, a extension. But the sixth is synonymous sometimes with the 13th. We can kind of interchange the two depending on the context of the chord. And altered extensions, meaning flat nine, sharp nine, 
sharp 11, flat five, uh, flat 13. Okay, these are your altered extensions. Advanced, so specialty and modern chord sounds like we talked about with the slash chords and the poly chords. Um, there's so much more uh, into that, but I don't wanna get too bogged down by that. Um, that's some stuff that you can do on your own or ask a teacher, ask me if you want. Um, I'm open to your questions. Um, so I would start by learning your chords on your instrument by arpeggiating them, okay? Just like I've been doing on my saxophone, playing one note at a time from bottom to top and back down. Um, I can play a C major triad. Right? Very basic. I want to get to the point where when I see a C major chord, I can play it. I can play it without thinking about it. I can just run through it very quickly. I know it really well. Chordal instruments can just play the chord and arpeggiate, meaning guitar, piano, even bass. Okay, you can just play the chord right on there, all notes at the same time. If you play a non-chordal instrument, also learn these chords on piano. Very important. I did a master class here uh, for uh, key, learn it, jazz keyboard for the non-pianist. Okay, you can see that in the in the sessions, and we talk about um, you know an approach to learning jazz keyboard if you're not a keyboard player. It really helps solidify your knowledge of chords and uh, enables you to explore the things on your primary instrument even more. It helps with composition. It helps with ear training. There's so many benefits to learning the piano as a secondary instrument, or even you don't even have to play. You know, I'm not a great piano player, but I know where all the chords are and I can voice them and I can, I can play chords and I can compose. And um, it's just so much fun. I can just sit and, and, and work stuff out and I can see it. That's what's great about the piano is I can see it. I can't see, I can't turn around and look at my fingers here. It's all tactile, okay? But I can see what I'm doing on the piano. And it's super important. You can find as many ways to conceptualize what we're talking about. That's really gonna benefit you. It's gonna give you an advantage to learning your chords and really solidifying them in your internal ear. Um, so practice these chords on the full range of your instrument. You heard me kind of ar arpeggiate up and down the full range of the instrument. Um, memorize them as quickly as possible. I'm gonna give you some ideas on how to do that. So right now, ways to practice your chords. Ideally, we wanna learn all of our chords in all keys. This will take time, patience, persistence, and consistency, okay? Chromatically, up and down in half steps. So I can do my major, try, major seven chords up and down in half steps. <laughs> so on and so forth. I can do it down in half steps. Okay, being able to get around on your instrument in all of these ways is going to give you more dexterity in what you're uh, trying to do up and down in whole steps, okay? And when I say six at a time, you can only cover six keys, then you have to start over a half step up. Um, if you play those, you'll figure it out. So if I start on C, then I have to do C, C major seven, D major seven, E major seven, F sharp major seven, A flat major seven, B flat major seven, and that's six. Now I'd have to go back and start over a half step higher with C sharp major seven, and do whole steps again to cover the other six because there's 12 keys total. So C sharp, D, D flat major seven, E flat major seven, F major seven, G major seven, A major seven, B major seven, okay? Cycle of fourths. Some people call it circle of fourths. There's a circle of fifths. I like to call it a cycle of fourths because it's functional in jazz. Most, this is the most common chord movement in jazz songs or tunes is to learn the movement of the fourth, okay? Uh, perfect fourths specifically. 
So chords move in this way, like a two, five, one, the root movement of that progression in jazz is by fourth D up a fourth to G up a fourth to C. We can go down a fifth, which is the same type of movement as up a fourth. Any other ways you can think of them? You can practice these things in major thirds, minor thirds, et cetera. Um, augmented thirds, uh, minor sec, well, we did minor seconds. Um, you know, uh, minor sixths. After a while, you start to, excuse me, after a while, you start to kind of rehash the same stuff. But in as many ways as you can think of them, um, and it says also in there, learn about intervals so you know how to do this, okay? If I did a major thirds example, then I could go, let's do major seven. Then from the C, I would go up a major third to E and do E major seven. From there, I'd go up another major third and do, um, what is it, E sharp, it would be F. Wait, no, sorry, G, G major seven. I did the lower register. So being able to do these in as many ways as you can, it's going to open up your ear, it's gonna train you to be able to react um, when you're improvising over chord changes. Now that you know all your chords, what do you do, right? What's the point? We sit here and we, 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 we do all the heavy lifting. This is all the heavy lifting. It's the prep work. Okay, now it's time to start working on improvising over your chords. Now you don't have to learn them all before you start doing this. Maybe learn a few so you can get going, okay? Um, but your end goal should be able to play all of those types of chords in all of the keys in as many different ways as you can. Okay, that's our end goal. And this is a constantly, it's, it's a long process. It takes a lot of time. Persistence and consistency is what we've talked about. And patience, patience. Time to start working on improvising over chords. So best way to do this, find friends to jam with or purchase a chord app. Now, friends to jam with sometimes is few and far between nowadays with uh, what's going on, but it's slowly getting back there. Um, you know, if you're going to do it, do it safely. But you can also do this on your own and uh, with chord apps. Now, it used to be back in my day, I'm getting old, uh, Band in a Box was like a computer program you could compose and do chords and do background stuff. <clears throat> nowadays, there's just tons of them. Um, excuse me, you, there's just tons of them you can do. Um, there's recording software that'll do it for you. Um, my favorite one to practice with is called iReal Pro. And if you haven't gotten that as a jazz student or someone who studies jazz or works on jazz, it's awesome. It's so worth it. Please get it. It's incredible. Um, it's available on mobile devices and desktop computers. I've got it on my desktop. I don't know if we have time for a demo because I know I've been going for almost an hour here. Um, um, I'm not sure. Is it okay? Can I, can I show my screen and do a brief, just show it? Is Absolutely. that all right? Absolutely. I think that would be a great thing to show. Excellent. Especially all right. Inspiring students to see why Perfect. this is such a great, great app. It's amazing app. I just love this and I use it all the time. So hopefully everybody can still see my screen and it's coming up right here. So as you're looking at my screen and my mouse over here on the left, I've got a list of 2,091 songs. What this is, is it is a chord, uh, chord writing app. <clears throat> when you get it, it comes with some pre-made uh, charts that have chords on them. If you see in my playlist, the Jazz 1350, this is 1,350 jazz tunes already built into the app, okay? It comes with a forum, a public forum, where you can go and look for chord charts. Now, granted, these are done by other people, so you wanna be careful. And if you wanna be, make sure that you're getting the correct changes, you wanna double check it with a, um, a published source like the Chuck Schur New Real Book, you can do that. Use a published source. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got tons, tons here. Um, now with my earbuds in, you might not be able to hear 
Um, but if I go to something like, let's see, um, what's a good little thing? Let's search real quick. I'm going to do little sunflower. I'm sure it's in there. There it is. This is a great beginning jazz tune to learn on. Um, there's not many chord changes. There's only three types of chords. And um, it gives you a lot of time to experiment and feel out these chords and learn these chords. I love this little tune. It's super great. Um, you can customize the track here on the right. Um, it says jazz, even eighth style. You can change the tempo if it's too fast. You can change how many repeats. Now this has got three. If you want to jam for a long time, just push that baby down. You got 30 repeats. You can play forever on this thing. Well, 30 repeats forever. <coughs> Excuse me. You can change the type of accompanying, accompanying instrument, how much you want of it. If you're a piano player, just take that right out. Now you can play along. All right. If you're a drummer, take the drums out. Work on your, uh, work on your stuff. Work on your fills. Work on you know, your phrasing. Work on your feel. You can do a ton of stuff with this. Um, embellish chords, <clears throat> chord diagrams. It can show you guitar chords, piano chords, ukulele chords, chord scales. We talked about chord scales. As it goes by, um, I'll just hit chord scales, chord diagrams. Oh, well, there's the library. So you can go through and it shows you for that particular, or you can choose what it is and it will, it will, it will, it will spell it out for you. Um, C major, they're showing you all the different, or all the different types of chords you can play over the C. And um, now there's not a lot of context for some of this stuff. So um, if you know more about theory, you'll be able to um, utilize this a little bit more. Um, again, go over to um, musictheory.net to learn a little bit more or, you know, take some private lessons or take a music theory class. Um, I'm going to unplug my earbuds for just a moment. And I hope everybody can still hear me. And I'm going to turn up this volume so you can kind of hear. And we'll, we'll, just, uh, we'll just play. So if I double click on here. And it's highlighted. So you can keep track of where you are. So I love this app. It's fantastic. You can even repeat sections. Let's say you just want to work on this section right here. Click and drag. And there's a, I know there's a little, I think this is a new version. I need to go and find the, uh, find some of the hot buttons on here. Um, and you can just repeat one single section over and over. I could just repeat these four bars and work on my C major seven chops. Um, now, what's great about this, I have this for desktop. It's a little bit different. I'm used to using it on an iPad or an iPhone or a mobile device. Um, I use it a lot on that. So um, I highly encourage everybody to get this if you want to learn and you want to work on some chords. I've created exercises on this thing, like dominant seventh workout exercises, minor major seven chord work workout exercises, two, five, ones, progressions I'm not familiar with, um, chords I'm not familiar with, so I can sit and just hear it behind me and work on that. How, how, how am I navigating this? You know, am I, am I nailing all the chords? What does this particular chord tone sound like against the chord that's being played? Um, it's really important to understand that and to be able to hear it inside, uh, hear it internally. All right, so this is a fantastic app, totally worth uh, purchasing it for either desktop and or your mobile device. All right, I'm going to uh, click out of that and let's get back to this. Uh, there we go, good. Okay, now here's some of the meat. Approaches to improvising over chord changes. I'm gonna plug in my earbuds again. Everybody can hear me now. Okay, so approaches to improvising over chord changes. This is what you're here for. 
we got all through that that uh, stuff not as quickly as I'd hoped because <laughs> you know we've gone on for a bit. But that's okay. No time time constraints. And you can go back and watch this if you're watching this on the replay. You got all the time in the world. It's amazing. Okay, number one, you want to practice one chord type or quality for a long time. Get yourself familiar with it. Really hear the notes in the chord. You can really challenge yourself to see if you can, or you can really challenge yourself to see if you can sing the chord tone. Well, that should be tones, sorry about that. Singing can reinforce your ear on what uh, that chord tone sounds like. So if I give myself a pitch reference, C, um, and my voice is really not perfect, not great, and it doesn't have to be, but I'm especially a little handicapped because I'm a little sick. So if I have this, uh, let's go more in my range. C, da, 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 da. Now, I've been doing a lot of ear training and I've done this for a long time. I can sing a C major seven chord without having to hear the rest of the notes, just by hearing a C. C, E, I'm close, E, G, B, C, E, G, B. <laughs> My voice is cracking because it's I'm just not well. You don't have to have a perfect singing voice, okay? That's not the point. It's not the point to be able to, unless you are a vocalist by profession. If you're a jazz vocalist, then, then by golly, you better have a good, good tone when you're singing. But if you're an instrumentalist like me who does not sing often, I've been known to do some karaoke, but don't tell anybody. Um, um, if you are... Uh, if you're an instrumentalist and singing is not your primary uh, voice, you know, I encourage you to, to experiment and see if you can hear those tones inside because singing is an outward expression of what you hear inside your head, okay? And as has been quoted by many a great jazz master, if you can sing it, you can play it. And I thoroughly believe that's true. All right. Um, I like to play one note with a varying rhythm so I can get the sound of that note in my head while hearing the chord. Um, oops, I kind of messed up on the, on the verbiage there. Chord you are working with, the chord I am working with. So if I'm working with um, C major seven, then maybe I'll put on the iReal Pro on C major seven, let it play and pick one note and just mess with it. Play varying rhythms so I can get the sound of that. So one and two, one. I'm going to pick the seventh, okay? Because I like that note. It's very, it's very colorful, okay? And it's, it's, it's really, really fun. So the seventh, one and two and one, two, three. So I'm just playing whatever rhythm that comes to my head, but I'm sticking on that note so I can hear what it sounds like. I'm trying to be creative with rhythm, focusing on tone and the note, and then also focusing on that rhythm where I'm not having to think, oh, what other notes do I have to play? Okay, this is a really good way to get yourself familiar with the sounds of the chords and each of the chord tones. When I say chord tone, I'm referring to root, third, fifth, seventh. Okay, those are your basic chord tones for any basic chord. Practice playing just the chord tones, root, third, fifth, seventh, like we said, improvise simple rhythms with chord tones only or arpeggios. For beginners, start with triads, just a simple major triad. More intermediate advanced players can go right into seventh chords or extensions, your ninths, your elevenths, your thirteenths, okay? That's where you really start to get a hold of some, some deeper, deeper, um, I keep saying context, but a deeper sound um, in uh, uh, more options, okay? You want options. Improvising is just like walking into a store with endless options of what to buy. And you're looking for stuff. Like if you've got a list, that's gonna make things a lot easier than going down every single aisle and going, 
uh, uh, do I want this? I don't know. Let me look. I'm going to do I, what, what, what do I want? Okay. So it's kind of like that. Try not to be too concerned when you're doing this about what you're playing. All right. What I mean is, you know, don't be concerned if it's like a, 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 a phrase that doesn't work right. Or if you lose time or, you know, focus on the sound of the notes against the chord. You know, you're focusing on one specific thing here. Um, in this type of exercise, okay? That's what we're doing. And when you can really tune in on that focus, it's gonna help you later with other stuff. It's all gonna fall together. All right, number two, find the scale associated with the chord. <clears throat> um, okay, so play the scale up and down with the one chord you're working on. Say it's a major seven, <clears throat> you can go up and down. Also, practice starting your scale on a different scale degree in a different spot, okay? And usually what ends up happening is you're playing what are called modes of a scale. And I don't want to get too into that. We use modes a lot in education. Talk about the Dorian mode, the Mixolydian mode, the Ionian mode, the Lydian mode, okay? We can go all, we can go really, really deep. But um, those are all just labels. They're just names, okay? Sometimes they serve specific functions in like modal music. But other word, otherwise you've got chords happening in very small, uh, very small time spaces, um, you know, a measure, maybe two measures at the most, depending on the type of song. So you don't, you don't have time to play all the notes all the time. And you don't always want to start on the root of the scale or root of the chord. So think of it as more of like a palette rather than a very specific thing. Widen it up, start on a different note of the scale. It doesn't matter if you know it's Lydian or Mixolydian or Dorian or Locrian or whatever. You know, you're trying to get familiar with the sound. All these theory things, they're labels. That's all they are. That's all they are. And people discover them without labels all the time and still do, okay? I just like labels <laughs> because I like to learn the context of it. It gives me a deeper understanding but you don't have to know all that stuff, okay? Here's another thing, arpeggiate the scale. What, what does that mean? Okay, what I'm talking about is diatonic chords and diatonic means belonging to the scale. So, you know, I could just play, you know, say like a C major seven, I will arpeggiate all of the notes in chord form, come up with, they, they, they come up with different chords, you know, and I get something interesting. So. Something like this. I kind of cheated at the end <laughs> and didn't really do it right. But you get, I hope you get the idea of what I'm trying to do there. Um, you know, when I go up, I started ba -da -da -da, ascending chords, okay, arpeggiations. And then going down, I kind of, I flipped it and I went um, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Okay, so there's lots of different ways you can do that. Um, experiment with holding tones of the associated scale. Get to know which, which tones sound good, all right, or fit, which and which do not sound so good. Um, example, on major seventh chords, the fourth scale degree of the major scale is not ideal because it clashes with the third, the tone that indicates the quality of major. Now, this is a little theory heavy. So, um, you know, with that type of thing, you want to have a little bit more basic understanding of music theory. Go to that musictheory.net uh, website and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Um, don't get too hung up on scales. Okay, scales are great. They, they train our ear, they train our fingers, they're good for technique, um, but there's a hidden trap. Again, if you always play in implied scales over chords, that's all you begin to hear. And again, Abersold syndrome, okay? There are more interesting ways to improvise and conceptualize. Three, begin practicing on moving from one chord to another. Now, here's where things kind of start to get a little bit more challenging, all right? So pull up a simple song. We pulled up Little Sunflower. I got a couple more here that don't have a lot of, uh, don't have a lot of chord changes. So what? 
two chords. That's it. Two chords. Midnight Voyage, maybe three chords, I think, three or four. Um, and suspended chords in that tune, which is awesome, or slash chords. <clears throat> so practice moving from one chord to another, or one chord tone to another chord tone right when the chord changes, okay? Doing this slowly and repeatedly will help you internalize the chord changes. So you're practicing how to land in the right spot when the chord changes. Are you always gonna do that? No, okay, because it gets boring. You might delay it a little bit, or you get some advanced techniques. You might have some silence when the chord changes, okay? But you're trying to do a very specific task. You're trying to figure out how to move from one chord to another, okay? That's it, that's all you're trying to do. Because once you understand that, then you can take it to the next level, all right? Use the chord tones of each chord to guide you. Smooth note movement between chords promotes good, what's called voice leading. This makes you sound like you know what you're doing. And we all want to sound like we know what we're doing. I don't think we want to sound like we don't know what we're doing, okay? Um, lots, of, lots of younger players or inexperienced players and even experienced players sometimes sound like they're meandering. I can sound like that sometimes if I'm not focused, okay? If I'm not really being uh, honest with what I'm playing or if I'm thinking about something else while I'm trying to play my instrument, I'm not focused enough on, on what's going on in the moment. So, um, you know, practicing this stuff gets you prepared and it really, really um, solidifies uh, what you're hearing and helps you move from one chord to the next. Guide tones, we've talked about guide tones. Uh, um, I've referenced them just a bit. Most jazz tunes have a lot of functional harmony, meaning that the chords move in a very specific way. Um, understanding how guide tones work will help you create more smooth and pleasant sounding lines, okay? You do not have to be a theory genius to improvise, but some theory knowledge helps. And we've talked about this before. Check out musictheory.net or, uh, I said musictheory.com. I think I meant musictheory.net. Yeah, oops. Sorry about that. Musictheory.net. Um, I'll, I'll try to send a corrected version of this, a, uh, a PDF uh, after this session so we can get the right version up there. I'll, cor I'll correct that. Um, for a great overview of basic functional harmony, you can practice your theory chops too. And it's free. It's totally free. All right. Another good source is www.learnjazzstandards.com. I've found that this is a really nice modern type of source. Musictheory.net's been around for a while. This Learn Jazz Standards uh, website um, has a lot of helpful hints, a lot of tips, a lot of instruction. Um, it's really fantastic. Um, I really, really, really like it. All right, cross course and guide tones. In a typical two, five, seven, one progression, um, thirds and sevenths are your guide tones. They guide you to the smoothest way to move from chord to chord. So here's an example. The third of the two chord turns into uh, the seventh of the five chord, which means it doesn't move, okay? And then the seventh of the five chord resolves down to the third of the one chord. This creates a nice smooth voice leading. And then I've written it out here, D minor seven, G7, C major 7, that's a 2, 5, 1 progression. So the notes I would play, F is the third of the D minor, and then we stay on F for the G7, and then we resolve down to the third of the C major 7 by half step. That's what's so strong. You know your resolutions and you know your guide tones. It's going to help you create those melodies. You use those guide, guide tones as springboards and goal notes to uh, aim for uh, uh, resolving the chords and changing right when the chord changes, all right? Um, another way to look at this, if we look at the seventh of the two chord, we look to the third, so we look at the seventh. Seventh of the two chord, okay? Uh, the seventh of the two chord actually resolves down to the third of the five chord. I'm fingering on my saxophone. <laughs> Not that you guys would know if, unless you play saxophone. Seventh of the two chord resolves down by half step to the third of the five chord and then that retains itself to function as the seventh of the one chord. 
So we got the same progression, D minor 7, G7, C major 7, and we go C, B, B. Okay, that's an example of guide tones. You can play these guide tones, thirds and sevenths, in songs that you're working on, and the chord changes. They may not always resolve perfectly like two, five, one. That really works when it's that fourthy movement, cycle of fourths, okay? Um, there's chord, tone, chord progressions that don't move that way, but you can still find resolution points, either by step, half step, or maybe even a skip or a leap, okay? It just depends, but you wanna look for those. Number five, connecting notes from chord to chord, okay? Practice creating lines where you connect the last part of the chord that you're in to the chord that you're moving to. <clears throat> Guide tones do this for you, excuse me. Begin by trying to connect a chord tone, root third, third, fifth, or seventh. As you get better at this, you can connect to extensions and other colorful tones, meaning elevenths, sixths, ninths, okay, altered extensions, all of that stuff. Experiment. Play anything that comes to your head for one chord, but then when you are about to change to the next chord, practice landing on a chord tone of the next chord. This is so hard to demonstrate here, but you know I can do whatever I want and then end on the, uh, the third of a C major seven chord. So third of C major seven chord sounds like this. So I'm gonna play a little line that's going to uh, help me resolve to that note, okay? Here's the line. Now that's a very common jazz lick, very precise, very uh, played over and over and over and over again. It works, it's a great little filler, okay? But I could do whatever I want if I wanted to and then you know, resolve to that, uh, that E. Here's another, here's another way I can do it. So I just played a bunch of random notes, kind of, and then I resolved to the same pitch, just up an octave, because that's the direction I was heading, right? Doesn't have to be that, but I could do, well, I ended on the root. Okay, so practice different approaches. Um, you can outline a chord before it. You can play whatever you want. Experiment, experiment. Doesn't always have to be functional, right? Um, questions you wanna ask yourself though, does it sound good? Am I resolving it? Okay, does it sound good? If it doesn't sound good, you don't wanna play it, okay? Um, when starting this process, use the KISS method. I love this method. Keep it simple, silly, okay? Don't overthink it. Start slowly. We crawl before we walk and we walk before we run. So it's really, really important to start slowly and stay consistent with that. Um, if you try to move forward too fast sometimes, more than you can handle, you end up making mistakes or misconceptualizing something. So really take your time and dig in, okay? All right, we're almost done, guys. I appreciate you hanging in there with me. I'm, I have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. I love doing these things. All right. Um, filler material. Every great jazz master has filler material, meaning it's just nonsense stuff. It's not super impressive. It's stuff to get you through the changes, okay? Use prepared lines or licks that fit the chord, like the one I just did. ba ba do ba da ba di bo da Look at me. I can sing it, right? I can play it. ba ba do ba da ba di bo da Or... Ba ba di ba da ba do ba da. Another variation on that, where I'm going down and then back up and resolving. Pentatonic scales make excellent filler material, and they sound great in almost any case. Okay, be careful about overusing pentatonic scales. You want to create interest and variety, and sound like you are spontaneously creating melody that makes sense, rather than guessing or meandering around for whatever reason. So. You know, in your practicing, practice through those pentatonics. Pentatonic just means a five note scale. There's lots of different pentatonics. You can look that up, go search it out. Um, I did a little master class on some scales and how to play uh, certain types of scales. I think that I mentioned some pentatonics in there. 
So I'm not getting too specific here, but pentatonic scales, go check it out. Um, uh, super easy and super fun to uh, get to know. All right, experiment with chromatic movements within chords. Example, all right, so a major seven chord. I like to play with ideas like moving chromatically from the seventh to the sixth, the sixth to the fifth, the third to the second, fourth to the fifth, and the second to the root. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is getting a little bit more in depth with what I'm doing. So you get these little chromatic movements within the scale in between chord tones, and it starts to sound very beboppy. Okay. Um, now I did do a master class on, on playing bebop and how to construct bebop lines. And this is one of those techniques that you can use. So, you know, from the seventh to the sixth. Uh, so there's the scale. So here's the seventh to the sixth. Right, that's kind of cool. Six to the fifth. Now I'm going both directions, down and up, right? Ascending and descending. Third to the second. Now I just combined the third to the second and the sixth to the fifth. Here's a really fun thing that I love to do. I love to do this very fast and I've practiced it. Or So that's a little tidbit of, of, of something I've worked out in all keys where I can insert it wherever I want if I hear it, right? Fourth to the fifth. So now what did I just do there? I combined a bunch of them together, right? Makes you sound like you know what you're doing. This is such a fun little trick. I love it. Um, so really what we're doing here, the point is, is to find interesting ways to approach and leave, uh, approach and leave chord, to chord tones and chords while focusing on landing on chord tones on strong beats, which are your number counts, okay, like one, two, three, four. Practicing this will solidify these tones in your ear, okay? It's gonna get the sound going in your ear so that you can do it in the moment, right? No matter how many times we practice, sometimes in the moment, it just doesn't happen. But you want to get it ingrained in you and your subconscious so it comes out naturally. Um, my uh, saxophone teacher in my master's degree told me, hey, um, you know, learning a lick or learning these things, uh, it takes a good three months of solid practice for it to really come out in your natural playing. So you have to be doing it a lot, okay, all the time. I swear I'm almost finished. Thank you for hanging in there with me, guys. Approaches to, uh, oh yeah, here we go. It's number six, resolutions, okay? You can, can play anything as long as you resolve it. Resolving your lines and notes gives context to what you immediately just played. All, things we, all the things we talked about previously assist in this. Arpeggios, scales, chord tones, guide tones, connecting notes, okay? Talk about another technique here a little bit later where you, where you kind of step outside the key. Do anything you want as long as you resolve it. If you come back to where you were, then it gives context to where you've been, right? That makes sense, okay? And it, and, and it gives your improvisation a sense of, ah, and this guy knows what the heck he's doing. It sounds awesome. That's so cool. How did you do that? That's amazing, right? People who are appreciating what you're doing. Um, or even the person that's not a music appreciator that just goes, whoa, whoa, what just happened? That's, that's, that's interesting. I like it. I like it. Okay. Not everybody's going to like what you do, but we just accept that. Eh, I don't care. I'm going to do what I want and I'm going to be my own worst critic. Um, there's some context for that too. <laughs> I shouldn't say it like that, but I hope you get the spirit with which I'm trying to communicate to you. All right. 
thinking outside the box exercises and techniques for further development. So this is here we're approaching the end. So number one, listen to the music you want to perform. Okay, you won't know how to do it if you don't listen to it. Get into it. You want to play jazz? Listen to jazz. You want to play smooth jazz? Listen to smooth jazz. You want to play rock and roll? Listen to rock and roll. You want to play Brazilian, bossa nova, Latin music? Listen to that. Get it in your ear, okay? Um, you know, I play a myriad of styles all the time. Constantly, I play in a wedding band where I have to play, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire, or Mustang Sally, or uh, Heaven forbid, Careless Whisper. <laughs> right? Um, but I know how to do it. Okay. And Kenny G, I can play Kenny G. But if somebody calls me up and says, "Hey, I want to do a wedding ceremony, and I want you to play all these Kenny Kenny G tunes. We're going to offer you oodles and oodles of money to do it. Will you do it?" I'm the yes man. I got you covered. I can do it. Okay. So, you know, listen to the music you want to perform or, you know, just depends on your, uh, depends on your box. Hopefully you're thinking outside the box. Okay. Here we go. Um, number two, transcribe solos. Okay. By ear first, then write it down as best you can. I like to keep a record of my transcriptions. Um, I've got a transcription book of transcriptions I've done where I wrote it out, but I learned it by ear first so I can internalize it. If you write it down first and you just read it, um, it does help, but it slows down that internalizing process. You want to try to learn it by listening to it, okay? Learn it by ear. Um, that's really where it is because this type of music is passed down by ear. That's where it really, really began, okay? Um, pay attention to how these improvisers connect and resolve their tones uh, from chord to chord. You will pick up a ton of things by doing this extra little step of study, not just transcribing it for the sake of doing it, but really examining it. Look at how they're changing from that D minor seven to that G seven. Look how they're resolving from a, a maybe a, a, a C seven altered chord to, um, you know, to a B major seven or something like that, you know, really examine it. Don't just, you know, uh, autopilot it. Oh, I learned this really cool lick. Here it is. Wait, do you have context for that lick? Does it work here? Does it work there? Where does it work? How does it work? Why is it cool? Why does it resolve? Ask yourself these questions. Dig deeper. It's more than just the surface, okay? Learn how, number three, learn how to copy sound, inflection, and extended techniques. Okay, some of these are like growls, doits if you're a trumpet player, all right? Altissimo if you're in saxophone land. Growls, um, you know, learn the extended techniques. Learn how to copy people's sounds. Um, I talk about this when in, uh, um, you know, learning to play big band, you know, you want to you want to be able to emulate certain players if you're playing a certain type of style of big band piece. Inflections like bends, um, falls, you know, learn the extended techniques of your instrument, you know, really dig into it, be able to do all that stuff. It's going to give you more expression options when you're playing your solo. I'm not always just going to be dry in my solos. I want to be able to express myself. A growl will do that. Altissimo will do that. Inflections, okay? You want to be able to do these things. All right, number four, the magic game. Oh, my goodness, okay? This was coined by Brad Good from the University of Cincinnati. He now teaches at the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, he was my uh, improvisation teacher um, at the University of Cincinnati. This is his game. And here's what you do. It's a it's difficult game. I can't demonstrate it now, but take any chord progression, start simple for right now, okay? Like say, um, maybe all the things you are or uh, autumn leaves, super perfect uh, tunes to start with, okay? Now, play through this, but only play chord tones on down beats, okay? Roots, thirds, fifths, and sevenths. Advanced folks can use extensions associated with the specific chord, so if it says, a nine, you can try to do that later. Play this at a slow, slow tempo, okay? Use eighth notes and try to connect the upbeats with the chord tones on downbeats. I'll say that again. Use eighth notes and try to connect the upbeats 
with the chord tones on downbeats. Always land on a chord tone on downbeats. This, we're not always gonna do this because Charlie Parker never did the, uh, didn't do it all the time, okay? Sometimes he put non-chord tones on strong beats and that's okay. But doing this first will give you a foundation for what sounds good first, okay? We need that. It's like learning the rules in order to break the rules or bend them later, okay? <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. You can approach any chord tone any way you want, as long as the downbeat is a chord tone. So you can do a chromatic, you can do a leap, you can do a skip, you can do whatever you want on an upbeat, as long as your next downbeat is a chord tone. And let me tell you, this is a very difficult game to do, and it takes a lot of focus. Um, real side side note: we did this in grad school. He did. Uh, you can do this too if you want. Write down all of the chord qualities in every key on index cards. Then, at home or wherever, spread them out on the floor. Shuffle them up, spread them out on the floor, and each index card is one measure. Now, whatever chord progression, doesn't matter if it's functional or not, play through it and play this game. I'll tell you, it will really change the way you think about approaching chords. It is going to sharpen your inner ear so much, you know, or better yet, once you get the index cards, shuffle them, use the iReal Pro app and put them in the iReal Pro app, say random chord, you know, magic game tune number one. And then do, I've done it with the iReal Pro app. It's so cool and so much fun and hard and challenging, okay? This is such a neat little trick. This is such a wonderful game. I love it. If you want more information, let me know. Um, I wish we had the time to demonstrate it. All right, number five, memorize melodies, okay? Good melodies use excellent voice leading and smooth transitions from chord to chord in songs. Often they will contain a note that is a chord tone or an extension that defines the type of chord being used in the moment, okay? There's a reason why you know, one of the chords says major sixth on it because maybe the sixth is in the melody at some point, right? The more melodies you memorize, the more material you're going to have to improvise with, the more creative you'll be in lines and understanding how melodies work and how they fit their, their associated chords with the songs. It's just such a good thing to do. Besides just, oh, I got to learn all these tunes, you know, because I'm a jazz major or I play in a jazz band or a jazz combo. It's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. It goes a lot deeper. All right, number six, play with shapes of a chord. I like to take a chord and just dig into how many ways I can arrange the notes that sound good uh, with the chord as filler material. And we talked about this a little bit earlier when I was talking about the minor major seven chord. Um, this allows me to really learn the chord inside and out. There's one type of chord that I just really, really have been uh, uh, interested in, and that's the diminished, uh, uh, diminished chords and diminished scales that I've been trying to work on. They're always a, a challenge for me. So uh, here's, here is a, a diminished scale that I've been working on. Okay, that's a diminished scale. Now, it's made up of two diminished seventh chords. So what I like to do is put this in iReal Pro, play slowly, and try to figure out different ways to, you know, what, what types of melodies can I come up on just the diminished seventh chord? such a fun sound. It's a challenging sound sometimes, but I love doing it. 
That's what I mean by playing with shapes. I'm taking the notes of a chord or a scale. <coughs> Excuse me, goodness. I think my voice is about done. Um, and experimenting with it, figuring it out. No constraints, but except just using those tones, right? Then maybe advanced, I can start using tones that are outside the scale to see how they work, see how they uh, move. Does it sound good? Is it cool? I don't know. Let's figure it out, right? I love experimenting. Experiment, okay? The more you dig, uh, the more other people will dig if you dig, right? All right. Um, number seven, playing outside the chord changes. And I talked about this a little bit. This is a very fun and popular thing to do, but it can be overused or used in a way where it just sounds like you are not paying attention to the chords, okay? This is a very slippery slope, so proviso, very slippery slope. Um, I recommend talking to a private instructor about how to do this or getting some instruction on, on, what, on, on how it's used so that you're not constantly going outside and um, you know, uh, pulling people's attention away from what you should be doing, okay? It's, it's, it's fun to do in the moment, but um, you don't wanna stay outside for too long or people are gonna lock the door and you ain't getting back in, all right? So sidestepping, playing a half step above or below or expressing a chord other than the one that is sounding, all right? That's a sidestep type of thing. So if I'm playing in a C major, the last note gave you a clue that I'm going back into the key of C. So I just moved into uh, D flat, half step above, and played some notes in that little pentatonic, D flat pentatonic, right? And then I resolved it back to the fifth of the chord down low, right? That gives me the context. If I resolve, it gives me context. Um, superimposing other chords over existing chords. Okay, Coltrane did a ton of this stuff. Experiment on your own or go seek out modern and contemporary artists that do this stuff. Excuse me. All right, pentatonics. The same pentatonic scale or idea can be played over multiple chord qualities. If the main chords of the pentatonic line up with the chord, it will sound in. Experiment, meaning it'll sound good. Experiment with pentatonic scales that are further away from the chord center. I like minor thirds. Stuff that's minor third away is really fun to do. Um, and it's, it's just far enough away that it kind of sounds, whoa, this is weird. Like if I'm, playing, if I'm playing C major pentatonic and I move up to an E flat minor pentatonic, then it's kind of funky. <laughs> right super fun really cool hip thing to do this is my last one okay eight compose your own solo to a chord progression create your own solo by using guide tones chord tones arpeggios scales etc this is especially helpful for fast tempo tunes where you need to just kind of be on autopilot mode right Rhythm changes, Cherokee, impressions, tunes that go really fast tempo. I wrote one out for the A section of rhythm changes, and I'll play it really quickly. It goes like this. Oh, I messed it up. So I kind of messed it up because I was playing a little slower, but I practiced it at tempo a lot. So when I go and someone calls rhythm changes in B flat, typically like, oh, guess what? I got something I can play, boom, that starts me off. It's filler material, it's composed, it sounds good, it's awesome, it's effortless, I don't have to think about it. And it gives me time to you know, process what's coming up next and prepare because I don't have to think about what I'm doing. It's a pattern, right? It's a pattern. Um, Pat Harbison is a trumpet, used to be a trumpet teacher at Cincinnati before I was there. I was, I had heard from other people's where he would say, you know what? I only have like maybe five regular licks that I play all the time to fill in almost anything. He goes, the rest is me just kind of bouncing off of those things. So, you know, you don't have to have, you know, a, a junk ton of transcriptions and 
and licks and stuff to, to improvise. You just need something to, to start with, you know, and then let your creative mind take over. You know, this takes practice. It takes a lot of practice to do and a lot of experimentation. And it takes time. So doing this helps you create your own filler material uh, you can use on similar tunes and allows you to get to know the song or chord progression you're working on, right? So take a tune you're having a problem with and write out a solo for it. Compose something, you know, uh, you can compose an eighth note solo only. Use the techniques we talked about the magic game. Um, use different rhythms. I could do a whole nother master class on rhythms. In fact, I'm going to approach Steve and see if he will let me do that because uh, I have a concept for developing your rhythms with uh, solos. Um, all right, we made it. You guys are awesome. Thank you for sticking out. If you've stuck around this long, kudos to you. Um, I appreciate you paying attention to what I have to say. Um, I'm very passionate about this stuff. Um, so conclusion and final thoughts, things to keep in mind as you work through this journey, patience, persistence, consistency. Learning to do this at a high or professional level takes time. Don't give up and learn from your mistakes. Always ask questions and keep seeking out answers, okay? Keep doing it, keep, keep on it. Always strive for good tone, articulation, and internal sense of time. All of this stuff we talked about is not gonna mean jack, okay? If you don't strive to sound good, you gotta have a good sound on your instrument. Articulation, be able to time your articulation with your fingers, okay, technique. I could say articulation and technique. I forgot the technique. And internal sense of time. Your time is so important. You've got to have good time, good swing time, good even eighth time, good funky time, all right? Play in the pocket. You know, being able to play ahead or behind the beat based on the situation you're in. Rhythm can be a challenge. Most of these exercises focus on long tones or eighth note lines. Think of different rhythms to try out while you are improvising. Ooh, there's a spell, uh, grammatical error. Oh man, I hardly ever make those. Ha <laughs> oops, your, should be R-E. I'm such a stickler for that and I missed it. Um, good time and rhythm will beat out notes any day, okay? If you don't have good time and you don't have good rhythm, all this note stuff, it's not gonna sound great, all right? Um, I could do a whole other masterclass, like I said, on that. Record yourself. This is like torture for me sometimes. <laughs> but do it. It may be unpleasant to listen to, but recordings never lie. Okay. Recordings never lie. Ask yourself, does what I play sound good? Does it fit the style I'm playing? How can I get better at whatever? Are you playing inside the changes? Is that your goal? Um, is your goal to always be inside the changes? Do you want to step out once in a while? Are you implying chord changes? Are you playing the right style? How can I get better? Ask yourself all of these types of questions, okay? You, when you do that and you have this self-accountability, you're going to grow as a musician and as a, as a performer. All right, go forth and navigate those changes. If you've got more questions, you want lessons, I give lessons, contact me, austinvickery at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for listening and I'll give it back to you, Mr. Kernodal. Go tell other people about the awesome things that you are hearing here at the Clearwater Jazz Holiday Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. You can always check us out on our website, www.clearwaterjazz.com. And don't forget, if you have suggestions of topics or if you want to give feedback or just tell everybody about how great Austin's session was, why don't you email us? Email us at info at clearwaterjazz.com. And then we'll see you on the next one. So everyone, keep it swinging. Austin Vickery, another great session. We really appreciate you. We'll see you on the next one. Thank Bye -bye. you so much. Bye-bye.